Genesis. We have been considering over the past um, two months the, the shadow of Christ, looking at focusing on the Christ as a whole, but today we want to look at Genesis 49, so as you will, turn there with me. And over this past two months, we have been looking at little vignettes, little portraits of Christ in the Old Testament. We have seen him as the creator, we've seen him as the seed of woman, as the redeemer, the seed of Abraham, the Melchizedekian priest, the Lamb of God. Last week, we considered him as the way, or the ladder of Jacob, if you would, when Jacob had the, the dream that he was the ladder. And we have seen much about his nature of the coming Messiah. And uh, today we want to look, I'm um, kind of moving forward because I know that we, there's a lot of detail in today's message, but we want to see Christ as the coming king today. Okay, And I wish we had more time that we could actually go to the millennial side and see the coming king, but we're going to do that later on this year and focusing on the Christ. After we look at the shadow of the Christ, then we'll look at the, the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, then we're going to look at the bride of Christ, and then we're going to look at the, ref, you know, the reflection of Christ, which is the bride of Christ, then we're going to look at the return of Christ, then we're going to look at the reign of Christ, and so that's all still to come. Okay, so you can kind of wait for the end of the book to get to the reign of Christ. But today we're going to look at the, the shadow part of that. And in this then, um, the, the, during these past few messages, the practical application has been, uh, at least I think, at least I've tried to make it really practical. You know, what in this passage, how does this apply to my life? The practical application today is not going to seem very practical to you. It's very practical for me, but, but until I t- ask you at the end why I did all this, you're going to say, why is he doing all this? It's going to seem like a whole lot of semantics. But the semantics are important in this passage. Because we're going to talk about, in this practical side, the meaning of Shiloh. Now, I'm going to read this passage, so this doesn't mean anything to you at this moment until we read the passage. But this is a key, a key, a key question right here. And so I want to read, beginning at verse, 20, or verse 8 of chapter 49 of Genesis. Genesis 49, verse 8. It says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Now, step back for a moment and talk about the general context. What's happening here? Jacob is about ready to die. And he's gathering all of his sons together, and he is, he's blessing them. He's blessing them. So he's, he's calling each one of the kids individually, piece by piece by piece, and he's giving them a blessing. When he comes to Judah, he gives more than just a, a one-line blessing. He actually opens it up, and there's actually a messianic statement that's being made that's not just for Judah, but for in all generations to come. And so, as we come through it, we look at this blessing as to him. We see in verse 10, which is our key passage here, verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. So, it's not going to happen. In other words, Judah's can continually have a what? a king, a ruler, an heir, whatever, until, and then there's this word until, which means what? There's, there's some point in the future that, that we're going to be looking at as a, as a qualifier. Well, what's the qualifier here? What's the discriminator? Shiloh, until Shiloh comes. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is about this word is that there's much debate about what Shiloh really is. It's not a word that is commonly used in the in the Hebrew, okay? And so there are actually four options, four options to what Shiloh can mean, okay? And uh, first of all, one that is used quite frequently is that is translated to whom it is due, okay? Now, I don't know if you have that in, in, in some of your versions or not, whether you, you, you may not see Shiloh there, you may see to whom it is due, it comes, until to whom it is due comes, okay? Now, there's a problem with this, um, and this is where I want to, I stayed up late last night to do this. I almost said, ah, oh, we're just not going to use the screen today. Um, but anyways, you're going to say this is all Greek, but it's not Greek. I just want you to know it's Hebrew, okay? So, so when you think this is, well, that's just all Greek to me, it's really not, okay? 
this is our word Shiloh. Now, what I've done for you is, in Hebrew, you don't read left to right, you read right to left, okay? And so let's see if I can use this pointer thing. Oh, there we go, okay? And so we really read this way, okay? So that's um, Shiloh, going this way. But I put it in English going the proper way, just so now you've got to figure out how to, to flip it around in your mind, okay? So if you're dyslexic, this really works today, okay? You, the, the dyslexic people are saying, I don't see a problem here, you know? The rest of you are saying, I don't get it. It's because you've been acclimated to, to our culture. Anyways, so that's our word Shiloh, okay? That's the way it is in the Hebrew text. It looks just like that, okay? And, and so it kind of makes sense there. You can see the, the, the transliteration of the letters coming down there. It really does look like what? Shiloh, doesn't it? Okay, now, in this option, though, they say it really doesn't say that. Really, what it says is, it's, it's really, um, it's, Two, two groupings. It's shlu, shlu, and so they they uh, they separate the the sheen from the others. Get rid of the uh, the, the the yod. The, the yod is the is up here. And so just kind of a, a little fun little side thing. This doesn't cost anything. But when Jesus says that every every jot and tittle of the law will be fulfilled, that's the jot right there. Okay, that's a yod. And yod when he comes over, it's it's a yot. Okay, and and. And through the Germanic languages, the yut becomes the j, and, and we don't say the j like a yut in, in Germanic, we say jot. And so instead of it saying yot, we say jot, and we think, a jot? What's a jot? It's actually a yod, okay? A yod. So until every yod and tittle, and I think a little bit later we're going to have a tittle that I can show you what that little tittle is as well, so you can see what Jesus is saying. In other words, he's saying that every little detail is going to come about. But anyways, so the first step in this in this option, that the people who say this, who think this is what it could be, they, they have to say that really it didn't say Shiloh. Really, that was, that was a twisting of things. It really said Shalu. Okay? And then once they take the Shalu, we, they understand that the Sh is actually a shortened form of the word Ashar. Because Sh by itself doesn't mean anything. And so you, you have to assume that it really was short for Ashar. And so what this says is Asharlu. But Asharlu um, is... Um, to whom do, but it's missing the, the, the noun, it. And so we have to add a word, and so now we have a Shiloh, okay? And so we go from Shiloh to a Shiloh, okay? Anyways, so survey says what? I mean, there's, too, there's too much gymnastics that is going on to... to to, to me, to defend this point. Does that make sense? I mean, if I've got to go through all that to say that to whom it's due is it, that's too much. You, you, you get it? You get it? So, I mean, you've got to go all the way down there to get to whom it due. <laughs> okay? It, it just it doesn't float by itself. Okay? So, anyway, so there's a whole lot of gymnastics. So, I, I say, in, in Brown Driver's Briggs, which is a, is a large um, Hebrew lexicon, Okay, which many people use, and that's why it's, you'll see it in print a lot, because they're going to go to Brown Driver's Briggs. Okay? And Brown Driver's Briggs says, this is what they think it is. But there are other real reputed lexicons that say, Brown Driver's Briggs don't know what they're talking about. Okay? And it's, it's kind of fun. And this is why, and this is where I'm jumping ahead, why interpretation is very important. You know? I mean, sometimes we just we read things and we don't think anything about it, but we have to think about it. We have to, why, do, why is it interpreted? Where, Interpreted the way it's interpreted. Because when you read your translation, your translation is translated by an interpreter. Do you get it? Because as they see some of these words, they're going to interpret what they think the word meant because there's going to be shades of meaning. Okay? So that's why there are different versions of the Bible, quote unquote, and stuff. All right. So that's number one, according to Bob, anyway. Okay? And you have to make your decision whether you think that's legitimate or not. I don't think that's legitimate. So I just instantly go, ah, sorry, I can't do that. So. So that one's gone. And, and that's because this word Shiloh, okay, you've got to come back to what do you think then Shiloh really is derived from. If it's not the, the, the splitting apart in Shilu, right, then what does it come from? Well, um, et, I always say this wrong. I always talk about the study of ants rather than the study of words. Entomology, did I say it right that way? Not entomology, etymology. Yeah, because entomology is the study of ants. So we're talking about etymology. Study bugs? Well, ants a bug, isn't it? Okay. All right. I didn't say we're studying uncles. I said we're studying ants. Okay. So, um, so anyways, but it comes from shalah. 
Okay, and shalat is the root word where we get the word shalom and all those these other words from. Okay, and shalat actually means to peace, to have peace or quiet, to rest or relax. And so, um, in the second part, then on the end, the ending there, the 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 o on the ending, this hey, okay, this the the, the hey has a has the o sound with it, refers to the fact that it's a proper noun. So when we look at shiloh, okay then we're talking about a word that's derived from shalah, but also is a proper noun. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, that's the whole point of it. So when you're doing translation, when you're doing um, expository work, you want to go to the word, whether it's Greek or Hebrew, and you want to derive, you want to come out of that and say, okay, here's what the word is. Now, exegetically, I want to derive my meaning from it, rather eisegetically, thinking this is what I think it means, and trying to drive it into it. Does that make sense? And so I think that first option was eisegetical, not exegetical. And so this is then what that word means. So we have now three options. Knowing that part, what could it mean? Well, option number one, if you would, in that, which is op- our number, option two, is that it could be the city Shiloh. Because throughout the Old Testament, there is this city referred to as, as Shiloh. Okay? Um, and so I think on your sermon note sheets, I might have some of those those places there, but grammatically, if you were looking at this and we're deciding, is this a possibility or not? Well, I mean, it is a possibility because it is Shiloh and the city is referred to as Shiloh, so that's a possibility. But look at, the, look at our context again, okay? Because now we're going to take this word and we're going to look at it in the context here, okay? Um, not just looking at the word and breaking it apart and all that kind of stuff, but looking at the word. Could it really refer to as the city? Well, if we look at verse 10a, in B by itself, in other words, I'm going to stop right after Shiloh come. The city shall not, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. Then I could say yes, that what I'm expecting in the future is what a city, not just city of peace, but a city referred to as Shiloh. That Shiloh will be restarted. Okay, and this this city will become important once more, and and that's when all this stuff's going to occur. Does it make sense? So if this, is, if this view is correct, then that's what I would expect. There are many people who go to the book of Revelation, and, and when they refer to Babylon the Great as fallen as fallen, they really are looking forward to, and when, when Saddam Hussein was in power, this, this view really took on a greater um, um, placement, and I, we talked about this two years ago when we went through the book of Revelation. There are many people who who are expecting the city of Babylon to be rebuilt, and that it's not being used figuratively toward another country or another city, but that it's actually referring to the city of Babylon itself, and that the city of Babylon in Iraq will once more become a, a, a place of great power. I'm not saying that I agree with that, okay? In fact, I don't agree with that, but that's okay. Um, but So the point is, it's the same concept, that there will be people then who are looking for Shiloh to be rebuilt, Okay? Now, the problem with it is, we've got to continue on, okay? Because in verse 10 it says, And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, okay? And so, now all of a sudden you've got to decide who the hymns are in the rest of this. Do you get it? And so, if it's referring to Shiloh, which is the proper noun, then that doesn't make sense for Shiloh to be binding his donkey and the colt of his donkey, and for, uh, for Shiloh then to washing his garments in wine and in his clothes. Okay? So, grammatically, it, it just doesn't make sense from that point of view. Okay? Um, and contextually, it doesn't make sense. Historically and, and prophetically, um, the, the, the bad thing about this one as well is that Shiloh it was a site for the whole nation, but not for the reign of Judah. Okay? And so, when Shiloh was used as a place of worship... It was when the whole nation was about. But what do we know about when, when David became king? He wasn't. He was in Hebron. But then, where did he? When, where was the, the the throne ultimately moved? Jerusalem. And so, where are we told, like in the prophet of Isaiah and, and other prophets, that the throne of David will be set? Jerusalem, not not Shiloh. Okay. So. So, you know, just contextually, this doesn't make sense. So, survey for Bob says, eh, that doesn't float either. Now, you kind of know that until I get to option number four, it's not gonna, I'm not going to say yes. Shiloh is peace, and shalom, Jerusalem, 
It could you shall out. Yeah. Um, but yes, that that could be true from that perspective. But since there already was a city called Shiloh that was in a different location from Jerusalem, I mean, yes, if 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 Shiloh and Jerusalem are are one, then this view would take what a greater possibility. Except for the fact the um, dipping is dipping Shiloh's robes in, in, in blood and stuff like that down to verse 12, 11 to 12. That wouldn't make sense from that perspective. Daniel? And I'm not saying I agree with this, but wouldn't that be saying then that the seat of power would be moved to Shiloh and that the king of Um, yes, if you if if you then interpret the his as messianic. Right, and so it's talking about Shiloh, but then the his refers to the leader of Shiloh. Yes, if if you if you if you switch those around, yes, hang with that though, and, and let's move forward with it, because you're going to see that these all three of these kind of dovetail. Does that make sense, Fran? That's right. That this is the only time that it's used figuratively, okay, potentially, okay? Option number three, it could be an appellative noun. You say, well, that's a big term. What's an appellative noun? Well, it's, it's kind of like what we talk about in Greek with a substantival. It's a noun that stands on its, its own. It's used figuratively for something else. And so it would mean rest or peace. And so um, since we know that that's shalat refers to rest and peace, okay, that it would say that these things are um, going to occur until what? Rest comes until peace comes and using that term like in, Pro, in the book of Proverbs where it says that hell is never satisfied making hell to be a kind of a personic um, kind of idea and so this would make this view would make um, Shiloh as a personic kind of thing and so talking about peace or rest until peace or rest comes again the, the same things I would say the same things to this one as I would to, to number two and that is that um, it seems like it's talking to more of an individual than it is to a concept. Does that make sense? So I say ant to that one as well. Um, the fourth one, which I think it is, and this is, you can see that you, you can kind of tie some of that stuff together, and I think it's a proper name, because that's what Shiloh is. It's a, it is a proper noun, okay, which means toward rest. And so the idea here is that in this proper name of an individual um, is that another name that is used for Messiah. Think about um, Messiah is also referred to as the desire of the nations. Okay, and we could go on with a lot of different um, names that Messiah is given. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm thinking of the one song, and my mind's blanking out on it. It just goes through all the different names of God and Messiah. You, you know what I'm talking about? Um, and so in in Isaiah nine verse six, we're told that He is the wonderful Counselor. He is the mighty God. He's the the um, everlasting Father, he's the Prince of Peace. So all these different names and titles are given to Messiah. So there's a potential that, you're right, being the only place where this is used figuratively, that Shiloh is actually being used as a title for Messiah as well. Now, would it fit on these other things? Would that fit contextually? Yes, it would fit contextually because reality is that, again, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, Okay, and we know in a few um, lessons from now, we're going to get to David, okay, that the reality is that David will become the one who sits on the throne of Israel, and we're told, we're given a covenant with David, that, that David will not lack a what? An heir to the throne, okay? And so we ultimately know that this Messiah who is to come is going to be the heir of David. He's going to be an heir of Judah as well, which we'll see in just a moment from this. But so I think that this scepter not departing from from Judah in the in the lawgiver between his between his feet is talking about Messiah himself. Now, does it make sense contextually, local context in this passage? Well, let's go on and let's read what it says about this Shiloh. It says Shiloh be binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Is that true? Huh? Yes. Yes. When you're talking about the um the triumphal entry um, of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, washing his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. What's the picture? It's judgment. OK? 
Okay? Christ did, you know, we're, we're told that he was, in a sense, dipped into the judgment, dipped in, you know, his, he, he bled for, for you and I, his suffering. Okay? His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Okay? Um, he was bruised for our transgressions and he was um, not more than what we could recognize, but still, he is one who was wise. Okay? His eyes were dark, his teeth were white. He spoke wisely. He saw wisely. Does that make sense? The richness that was there. Anyways, we can debate on this, but I think it's important for us to have a proper translation on this and understand that there is a a messianic nature to this passage. Um, If not, if not, um, then a lot of the other um, eschatology, things of the last times, really start to be um, a debate on this. And so, the Messianic nation, the, the, the passage would then say that, that Messiah, Shiloh, would be who? What, what else would you call him? He would be a man of, well, but Shiloh, use the name Shiloh. A man of peace, a man of rest. Okay? Last week, when we considered the, Jesus being the way, do you remember this? Okay? We went to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Do you remember, remember Christ being the, our access? Okay? And what was he access to? Okay. He's access to the throne room. Okay, in Ephesians 4, we were talking about this as 2. What did he give us? Peace. Ah, that's right. It's through Christ that we have peace with God. And so we're told in the book of Ephesians that he made both one and brought us peace. And so Messiah would be, then, a Messiah of, of peace. Okay? And so we'll talk about this. So, from Bob's perspective... That's, that's, the, that's the one I go with. Now, if you want to go with other, one of the other ones, that's fine. You can do that. But notice how 2, 3, and 4 all kind of really dovetail together. Okay? They're all talking about the same concept. 2, I think, would be hard, though, to, to justify, unless you're going to say that Shiloh is, is coming in with Jerusalem um, because of the fact of so much other con- biblical context where Jerusalem is the place where Christ is going to reign. And we're told that, it's, um, that it is Mount Moriah. We're, we're, we're given specifics about that it is Jerusalem, okay? So unless Shiloh really is another name for Jerusalem, okay, I just don't see how that could be held at all. All right, so the meaning of Shiloh, I think it's talking about, it's referring to Messiah. Now, the impo- yes, you certainly may. Could it be heaven? Could it be heaven? Um, The ultimate fulfillment of our rest is always in heaven. I, I think the prophecy, though, is really referring more to a, um, well, person or place, not necessarily that debate at that moment, but to one that is, is more in our time frame, in, our, in, in, in prophecy, not to post, you know, when you look at a lot of Israel prophecy, a lot of it doesn't refer to heaven itself. A lot of times, really, it's referring to millennial reign of Christ when the, when the Messiah is going to come, David, again, and he's going to reign on the earth. And that's what, for in Jewish prophecy, they're looking at, if you would, and I don't mean it this way, but we would, heaven on earth, you know, is, is when God is with us, literally reigning on the earth. And so that's why I think that it, it would refer to that reign, and that's why then I lean toward Messiah rather than toward even heaven as a place. But you are right. Heaven, um, in a sense, would be Shiloh, would be the place of rest from that perspective. The way you're reading 10 through 13, or 10 through 12, 12, is Shiloh is, and then it gives a description of how you will recognize Shiloh. And exactly right. It's a description of a person. It's a description of a person. That's exactly right. And so it's kind of hard to place, take those. That, unless number three, remember when we went number three and was using it as an appellative noun, unless... And that's why they would go that way in saying that Shiloh is being used like rest or peace with a personic um, personification in, uh, in, a, in that personic manner. So that um, so I'm referring to rest doing these things and peace doing these things. But, right, it, it just, that doesn't float. It, 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 to me, it, it has to... It's really hard to get to that point. Yeah. Like, oh. It's the straight out. For me... Like right. And that's for me, John. I mean, I just I would agree that I think that straight out, it just it seems rational to, to think that. So, 
The prophetic side of it, though, is talking about the actual rain, not just the meaning of Shiloh. We have great debates on that one. But the rain of Shiloh, and this is really what the important part is for us, and that is Christ's reign, the Messiah's reign, and what does it say about Messiah's reign? What do we know about Messiah's reign? First of all, we want to look at the descent of his reign. What do we know from this passage about Messiah? Remember, as we've been discussing, say again? No, no, well, his descent, where is he going to come from? Judah, okay? And remember, as we went through, and, 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 and I keep putting those pictures up there for a reason, okay? So that hopefully it's a reminder to you as how, the progression that we've gone through. You know, we've seen the fact that Messiah is going to be God. He's the creator. He's the, the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of Shabbat. We've seen that he's also going to be true human because he's going to be seed of a, of a woman. We're going to see that he's going to be a redeemer, and that, that God in the flesh is going to be seen where Job says, you know, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will see him face to face. I'm going to see him in the flesh. After my flesh is decayed and I'm restored, I'm going to see him in the flesh. And what an awesome picture. We know that he's going to be from the seed of Abraham. And so we're kind of defining it. Not just is he going to be a man from the human, you know, he's going to be in, in human flesh, but now he's going to be from the seed of Abraham. And then we talked a little bit more than within that about He's going to also fill the role of, a, of the priest of Melchizedek. He's going to be um, a sacrifice for us, the Lamb of God. But now we know that not only is, is he going to be just of the seed of Abraham, okay, but we've kind of skipped the, 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 the seed of Jacob a little bit as well. Well, no, we talked about that a little bit last week with the, the, the way, because God comes down and he renews the covenant with Jacob. So we know that he's going to be from Jacob, but now even more defined, of Jacob's 12 sons, Messiah is going to come through Judah. Okay, huge point, okay, because we know in the end times, now understand, I hope you all are, are dispensational, if you're not, you need to be saved, no, seriously, um, but that, that Christ is going to come again, and how is he going to come? In the clouds, okay, he's going to come in the clouds and he's going to gather us, we know that from the word of God, however, the sad thing is that probably the majority of mainline Christianity doesn't believe that. They're waiting for him to come on the earth. Now, some are all millennial, and they think he's not coming back at all. They don't believe in a millennium at all. And they think that he came in the, the clouds of the hoofbeats of the Roman army. For real. I thought for once it was a cult. I got something in the mail once. Somebody was trying to, to, to tell me that. And, and I guess I'd forgotten some of that from theology days, from um, seminary days or whatever. And I thought it was some cult, man. I thought it was somebody was really trying to just hand me a line, you know, Jesus, you know, and Jesus already came back, and, and he came in the clouds of the, 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 of the clouds of the dust of the, the um, Roman um, horses. And I thought, this guy, you got to be kidding me. And, and, and then I realized that it was real, and that's actually what, like, First Prez teaches. You know, that's, that's the all-millennial position. It's just kind of mind-boggling me. But anyways, so here's the point. If... When, when the Romans came against Jerusalem, when the Romans came against Jerusalem and they came with their hordes and all the cloud was billowing up behind them, that Jesus was present in those clouds. Oh, you're talking about 60 or 70 AD. When did, when did Jerusalem go? 70 AD. 70 AD. I always miss it. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Because that's when Jerusalem fell. And when you read Matthew 24 and 25, clearly Jesus is talking about the fall of Jerusalem. And, 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 so, and so clearly it was all fulfilled back in 70 AD, and we have been living in that time where Satan is bound since. So, um, <laughs> that's kind of fun, isn't it? Anyways, I always think if Satan is bound right now, watch out when, when he's let loose. So, anyways, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, anyways, but think about now. If, and then there's other segments of, of Christianity that, that are post-millennial, okay, that believe that we have to Christianize the world, before Christ will come. And Christ will come and he'll reign on the earth then, okay? And so we're going to Christianize the world. Now, what I'm getting at here, this is really important, because that's majority of Christianity it is waiting for, if you would, a physical Messiah. Okay, they're not waiting for Christ to come in the clouds. They're waiting for a deliverer on the earth. Now, they may not say it's Jesus Christ, you understand? But they're still looking for a Messiah Someone to, to 
turn the earth around back to Christ, to goodness. We're going to Christianize, we're going to Christianize the world. Christians, many Christians. Ah, the Jews, that's where I'm going next, okay? So now, no, that's okay, it's good, it's a good lead-in. So, so we, we go to, to the Jews, which are then the next one closest to us, right? And what are the Jews waiting for? They're waiting for Messiah. But they're not waiting for Messiah to come in the clouds. What are they waiting for? One who's going to go to the war, and the conquering king is going to come, he's going to go to war with the enemy, he's going to deliver them, he's going to set up the reign of David, and da 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 Okay? All right? What are the Muslims waiting for? One of the Sunni or Shiite. But as a whole, what do we see out there that... Okay, wait, they're waiting for the 13th Imam, who is, is going to do what? And he's going to do what? They're, they're looking for a deliverer as well. Now, they may say he's from, from, from Muhammad, you know, they call him the 13th of, of Imam, but the reality is they would say that Muhammad actually is, is after who? Christ. It's still a deliverer. Do you get it? There's still a messianic mindset even amongst them. Almost every world religion right now, I'll come right back to you, every, almost every world religion right now is looking for a physical deliverer. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, 100%. 100%. Uh, yeah, Christian, Christians want to see the world become what? Christians. Jews want to see the world become Jewish. Muslims want to see the world become what? Muslim. I mean, you know, Hindus want to see the world become Hindus. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're a follower of that, you would want to see the rest of the world do what you do. Okay. Anyways, the point that I'm making here, though, is the world is set up for a Messiah to come. Okay. Now, the thing that's really confusing here is we know that Messiah has to be what? It has to be the line of David. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, the line of Judah. You know, we'll get to David in a few weeks. But clearly we know as God is defining it, he's defining who Messiah has to be, only could be. Does that make sense? It gets rid of a whole lot of others. There were a whole lot of false messiahs during the days of Christ. But they didn't meet the qualifications. Now, what's really fun about this, for the Jewish perspective, okay, now it doesn't mean anything for the Muslims, okay, because they don't, they're not worried about whether he's going to come from the tribe of Judah anyway, okay? But do you know what happened in 70 AD as well, when the temple was destroyed? Their records, their records were destroyed. And so it's hard for them to prove lineage, literally, back to David, and then even back then to Judah. So anybody who would come claiming to be Messiah, would be hard-pressed to prove his lineage. That's why in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, I think it is, is it Luke 2 or Luke 3? Anyways, we have two different lineages of Jesus Christ. Both lineages are very, very key to point out that he comes from the line of Judah. Okay? Through Joseph, who wasn't his actual father, but was his paternal father on earth, if you would, and through Mary, who was his mother, through both the maternal and the paternal, Jesus Christ is from the lineage of, of Judah. Okay? So it's a very important thing. So his descent would be from the line of Judah. What would be the extent of his reign, though? The extent of his reign. Let's look at verse 8 here again. And it says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, politically, first of all, we want to look at the political side of this. His, his, um, his reign would be extended to who? Not only over Israel, but to who? The world. To all peoples. The word there is amim, which is the nations, the peoples. Okay, And so that Messiah's role would be not only over Israel, not only over Judah, but over the entire, entire, the, the entire earth. Okay, His kingship would expand, expand all the way there. Turn with me to Daniel, chapter 7. 
Daniel 7. And I think it's fun how God gives us information sometimes in, in different ways. And Daniel is having a vision, and he sees a vision of, of the end times. And so we're going to jump right in the middle of it. You can read the, the entire thing. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty good. Um, but beginning at verse 13 of chapter 7, we read, it says, I was watching in the night, visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now stop for a moment. One like the Son of Man. What is that another name for? Messiah. Okay? So again, going back to the Shiloh thing, you know, here we're not told that, and, and I was watching, Messiah came. You know, it says, one like the Son of Man came. Coming how? In the clouds. Okay? This is not just a New Testament principle. You know, there's many times I, I tell people, I believe in the rapture of the church, the harpazo of the church, the, the catching up of the church to Jesus in the clouds, not because of Acts chapter 1, not because of the book of Thessalonians, not because of 1 Corinthians 15, but I believe it because of the Old Testament. The Old Testament declares of, of, retur- of Christ's return and his returning in the clouds prior to the 70th week where God's going to once again deal with, with Israel. So we see that the, the Son of Man is going to come in the clouds he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all, in case you're wondering if there's any, any way to, to debate this one and to slice it, we're, we're going to use a bunch of synonyms here to make sure that you understand who he's going to reign over. He's going to reign over all peoples, nations, and languages that should serve him. His dominion is a what? Everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Remember that, we'll come back to that concept as well. We probably won't come back and read it again, but it's there. And so, again, the extent then of his kingdom politically is going to be how? Worldwide. It's going to be over everyone. Um, go to, um, to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. This is the extent of it in, in overing all the nations, which we already know, but I, I like this passage because it's, it really talks about the, the extent politically as well in the, the part we're going to get to with obedience here. And it says, and it shall come past, verse 16, I'm sorry, of, um, did I tell you the chapter yet? 14, thank you. Okay, 14, verses 16, 17. It says, It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Okay? So all the nations, okay, all the peoples, all the nations are going to go up and they're going to celebrate the feast of tabernacles. Verse 17. And it shall come, and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth, not just nations, but even tribes of the earth, do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. On them there will be no rain. So what are we told? That all the nations will serve this king. He's going to be over all of them. And he's going to demand what? He's going to worship, demand worship. He's going to demand obedience. Okay? And he's going to demand specifically that at the Feast of Tabernacles, that every nation will be represented. And every family of the earth will be represented. Okay? And if it doesn't happen, he's going to what? Use that rod, which we know from the New Testament is called the rod of iron. It's a rod of discipline. It's a rod of correction. And he's going to withhold the rain from them. I wonder how many droughts there will be the first year or second year, whichever way you want to look at that, in the millennial days. Do you get it? Because, you know, a lot of us, we think it's only going to be saints entering into that. It's not going to be the saints entering. It's going to be the, the nations who didn't necessarily align themselves with, with the Antichrist, with, with the beast that go into the millennium. Okay? And so there will be people going into the millennium who aren't necessarily what? Saved. Okay? And so I can see, just like kids like to do, just like people like to do, right? To what? To test it. You know? Do they re- is there really a bite to the bark? 
somebody, and I always tell the kids this on, in the summer programs when I'm, when I'm running it, somebody is going to want to find out whether I really mean what I say. Don't let it be you. Okay? Because you're going to find out. Were you ever in my summer programs, Caroline? You weren't. Man, I wish Chelsea was here then. Or, yeah. Because she, she, cause I always thought, I, this is going to be the funnest summer you ever had. Or this could be the worst summer you ever had. You know, because if your parents keep bringing you, you're stuck with me. Okay? And so, but I like, to be a lo- I like to be a lot of fun. But I also like what? You to obey so everybody can have fun. Okay? And so, this is how it's going to be. And so, Christ is saying the same thing. Some people say I'm kind of harsh. And I say, well, listen, at least I'm not reigning with a rod of iron. Okay? I mean, I mean and I'm not withholding the, fam- the, the, the rain. And so, the reality is that God expects what? Submission. God expects obedience. I mean, do you see the application to us? If when Christ is reigning on the earth, he says, you will be here for the tabernacles. And if you're not here for tabernacles, I'm going to withhold rain. Now, yearly. It's in the fall, September, October time frame for our calendar. I don't want to go beyond that. I don't know, John. I mean, that's, but yes, that, that clearly, no, no, oh, no, no, no. Feast of Tabernacles is a one-time feast. It, 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 it is the shadow. The Feast of Tabernacles is the shadow of God reigning on the earth. You know, that's what it was all about. That's what it pointed to. And so Christ, God with us, is there on the earth, and that's why I think it's important for them to come during that eight-day feast, that they're going to come and they're going to worship God, and they're going to come to the mountain, like we're told, and they're going to, they're going to learn from God. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of teaching going on at that time. There's going to be a lot of worship going on at that time. It's going to be a great festivity, okay? But, so I don't want to go beyond it and say how that is through the course of the year and stuff like that. I don't know. But clearly, God is going to expect what? People to obey. Okay? Um, Good. I don't know. I don't know if it will be then. All I can do is base upon, yes, it's, it's, the tabernacle is an eight-day feast. Yeah, Feast of Tabernacles is an eight-day feast. And the first day is a holy convocation of the Lord, and the eighth day is a holy convocation of the Lord when no work is done. But every other day in between there is a day of feast, feasting, and a day of celebration. Okay? So anyways, the point is then, the extent of his reign politically is going to be over all the earth, and he's going to expect obedience. Obedience. Okay? Um, Chronologically, we know not from this passage, but from the other passages um, that we've read, as well as in the book of Revelation. Okay? In the book of Revelation, we're told that this, this is going to last how long? 1,000 years. Let's turn there to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. Again, I find this is very important because of what I said earlier about all these other quote-unquote views that are put out there that, I mean, man, I, I, you know, I, I come so close to saying that they're very unbiblical because <laughs> I think they are. Um, you know, there are certain things, look, I mean, there are certain things when we get into the, the, the election and free will and, and I understand the, the range of debates that are in there, and, and, I can, and I can float with people on certain things, you know? I, I can't float when people go to extremes and deny either one. But I, and so I can, I can float with uh, people discussing and debating and arguing over how those two things come together, okay? It's hard for me to really <laughs> to float with on millennialism. Does that make sense? The, the fact that there's no millennium, when the Bible specifically says what? There is one. And so, Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they, they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads and their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You know what it says in the Greek? A thousand years. In, in verse 5, it says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until what? The thousand years were finished. You know what it says in the Greek? thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. What? A thousand years. Now, I I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm I'm dapped sometimes. You know, I mean, I I don't get it. But but God says three times it's going to be what? A thousand years. I note that many people who like to water down a thousand years like to water down 
six days, 24 hours. You know, day really doesn't mean a day. It means a yom. It means a period of time. And maybe it means a million years. No. God said that on the first day there was evening, there was morning. So do you have a, a half a million years of darkness, a half a million years of light? I mean, why can't we just accept what God says? And take it, like you said, John, for Shiloh, what it means, literally. Instead of trying to read everything into it, just, just take it and run with it, knowing that what? God... God can communicate pretty, pretty good, and he probably knows better than I do. You know, and, and he doesn't need me doing a lot of things to twist around just to, to say what he really meant. And so, so chronologically, we know that he's going to reign a thousand years. Okay, so his extent. Finally, we want to look at the content of his reign. Okay, because this is important. The first thing we know is that his reign shall be a reign of power. Okay, we saw back in, in Genesis that he's gonna, it's going to be a scepter. A scepter is a, is a source of power. If you remember, um, you, you kiddos who were in Miss Marsh's class, right? What did you talk about today, Anna? Who was this? Who's that, who's that lady? Or, I'm, oh, she's over here. Let's go to this side. Who's that lady? Who was that? Queen who? How soon they forget. You told her to me just a little bit ago. All right, who else was in Miss Marsh's class? Do you remember? Who were t- Queen Esther. Thank you, Liam. And do you, have your, do you have your picture? I love how, how God brings all these different lessons together sometimes. Okay? And so do you have that picture? And Queen Esther, who is she standing in front of? Who is this guy over here? He's not, a, he's not a brachiosaurus. What kind of a saurus is he? <laughs> he's not an ahosaurus? <laughs> what, was his, what, what did they call him? What did you call him? Asaurus. Ahasuerus. Ah, oh, I like Ahasuerus because it sounds like a dinosaur. Anyways, so anyways, he's the king, right? And, and I don't know if you, you, you uh, <clears throat> visually impaired people like me can see what's in his hand from there, but what's he holding in his hand? A golden what, Liam? What's he got in his hand? He's got a stick, a golden stick. <laughs> Scepter, thank you. It's a golden scepter. Now, it was really important because Esther understood that Ahasuerus, 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 anyways, had all this power, right? I mean, he was the king. He reigned over the whole world. And when Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus said, off with his head, it was what? Off with his head. And even if it was off with her head, it would be off with her head. And so, they come to, to Queen Esther and say, you know, you need to go before the king and intercede in, in behalf of the Jews because, you know, you, you're not going to be spared here either. And she says, well, all right, I'm going to go. If I go, I die, I die, you know, whatever. And so she says, just fast for me for three days. She goes before the king, and the king extends to her the golden scepter, which means that she's allowed to what? Approach, approach come into his presence. That scepter was the symbol of great power. He didn't have to say a word. He extended her the scepter, which meant what? You're received. If it had dropped the scepter, it had meant what? The blade is dropping. Do you get it? I mean, he didn't have to utter a word. He just had to move the magic wand, the scepter, and it was a done deal. Christ is the one who's going to reign, which we refer to in Revelation as that rod of iron, okay? But he's going to be the symbol of great power, in which we've already talked about it, with his extent. And so, he's going to have power, we're told, in verse 8 with that lion. Oh, forget you've seen that. Um, militarily, okay? And then, because he's going to be like a lion, but also he's going to have great power legislatively, and that's the scepter. Secondly, we know that it's going to be a reign of Great peace. Why do we know that? Well, here I'm going to go back to that word Shiloh, and I'm going to bring in why he is given that, that name. Okay, And that why is Messiah, why is the king to come, going to be referred to as Shiloh? Because of the fact that Christ isn't coming to reign with a rod of terror. Do you get it? It may be a rod of iron, but the purpose of his coming is not to have a, a reign of terror. It's going to be a reign of peace. Now, I, I, don't, I don't put a lot of stock, quote-unquote, in 
um, unbiblical sources. Okay? I'm going to give you one, so just tell you. <laughs> um, I wrote a paper years ago on the New Age movement. Okay? And so in doing that, I did a lot of research on astrology and, 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 and astronomy. And, and I read books like um, The Divine Wisdom That Illumines the Mind by Bagua Rajneesh and um, all these other guys. Okay? I, I'm not encouraging you to do that. Okay? But I, I did that for, the, for, the, for this um, paper that I wrote on New Age movement. And what I found is something that I found really interesting. Satan always likes to take truth and do what with it? He mixes it with, with air. Okay, with lie. Um, that's what he did with Eve, right? Now, most people who believe in astronomy and astrology would also believe in creation or evolution. Evolution. Okay, that just kind of makes sense, right? New Age movement, da 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 da, right? Um, and so, that being the case, for me to tell you that a star age in astronomy and astrology is 2,000 years, how, how, many, how many astrological days? You, would you think that they had? At least 2,000 of them. I mean, just multiple of them, because 2,000 times 2,000, you know, you're into the millions and billions, right? Would you believe three? Now, isn't that interesting? If each astrological age is 2,000 years, and they hold to three, that would mean the Earth is really only 6,000 years old. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing. Anyways, the first one of those astrological ages was the age of Aries, which is the, the, the ram. And if, it's interesting if you go back and you do research historically, that you'll find prior to Abraham, prior to that time frame in the first 2,000 years of the world, biblically speaking, that the primary object of worship was the ram. The second star age was the age of Taurus, the bull. And what did... Uh, what did Israel fall down before on the way out? The golden calf, the bull. That was Baal. Baal worship was, was seen by the bull. We're currently in the third star age. It's the age of Pisces. Anybody know what Pisces is? Anybody know a world religion represented by a fish? You probably have one on the back of your car. Christianity. Isn't it interesting? And back in the 1960s, now you, again, I'm not you know, putting a whole lot of stock in this, but back in the... The 40s and 50s, there was a guy named Benjamin Cream who was considered the, the John the Baptist of the New Age movement who declared that Messiah was born. That's interesting, huh? And in the 60s, the Broadway musical Hair declared the next star age. It says, when the moon is in the seventh heaven and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will fill the planets and love will fill the stars. It's the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Oh, you all know that song, and you can da 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 da. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, and so you can all kind of see the fifth dimension and the big balloon going up, right? So, um, but what was the age of Aquarius? It's the age of peace, not just water. It's peace. The tranquility of the water is the idea of it. It's the age of peace. Satan knows the plan of God. Satan will always seek to set up his own counterfeit. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Because someone may come in with another Jesus, they may come in there with another gospel, they come in with another spirit, and you may very well what? Believe it. Accept it. And that, he says, and these are, these are, you know, these are false apostles, for Satan himself transforms himself to look like an uh, angel of light. Therefore, it's no marvel, no wonder, if his, his workers also transform themselves to be, look like what? Workers of Righteousness. There are people, I believe, whether they know it or not, and I don't want to go into all that, who are workers of the devils, who think that they're workers of Christ, or are purporting themselves to be workers of Christ, and they're leading people down the wrong path. And they're getting the world to look for a wrong Messiah. Because Satan is trying to set up his own kingdom. We call it the New World Order. And it's amazing to me, again, do the research, how many in our political system are buying into that? Both sides of the aisle, folks. My faith is not in one side of the aisle or the other. They're all being duped. Unless they know Jesus Christ and they're looking to the true king. It's going to be a true reign of peace but it's going to be a reign of peace because 
he's going to be able to have what? Great power. The more the world seeks its own, the more we need greater what? Restraint and power to bring in peace. What's happening all around the world right now? Revolution, conflict. Okay. How is Bahrain handling it right now? With power. Okay. And, 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 how, and how does the world representing that? How is the world representing Bahrain's response? Brutality. Brutality. Now, now here I'm saying, I'm not here to, to, to do the Tiananmen Square clampdowns and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, you understand, I'm, I'm not here to justify tyrannical um, empires. Okay? But the fact is, authority is authority, right? And there is, a, there is a misuse of authority, but there's a proper use of authority. And if you rebel against God, is, is God going to usurp his authority <laughs> and let you become God? Because you decided he shouldn't be God anymore? Isn't that how we treat... I mean, think about it. Look at Egypt. Look at... Is it Libya? The, the, uh, Tunisia. Yeah. And look, I mean, look at this. What do they want? They want the one in authority to do what? Step down and let them choose to be who was going to be what? In authority. We live like that sometimes with God. God says, if you just submit to my power, you'll have what? You'll have peace. And then finally here, it's going to be a time of prosperity. Because of the fact that God is reigning with power and bringing great peace, there will be as well a time of great prosperity on the earth during that time. Spiritual applications. Again, listen. In the world I may have tribulation, but I can be of good cheer. Why? He's overcome the world. And if I just submit to the power of God and the reign of God in my life. I will in my life have great peace. In having that great peace, I will become very what? Prosperous. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law. 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 Not just word. We want to water it down and say word. okay? Because law almost seems like a bunch of rules, which means I'm under somebody's reign, rather than me just choosing to do the following thing. Does that make sense? Anyways, I'm, I'm not trying to... Anyways, he delights in the law, the rule of God. He delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And because of that, he shall be like a what? A tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit into the season. Its leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Do you get it? If we would just submit. Now, I'm not picking on you. I'm talking we, okay? I'm talking Bob. I mean, Bob bucks sometimes. Bob wants what Bob wants, okay? Now, hopefully it's becoming less and less in my life, but I would probably be lying. Anyways, but uh, I'm God, if God, if, you know, I don't want this, the big video screen put a Bob's life and Bob's heart for you guys and Bob's mind, okay? You don't want to see it, and I don't want to see yours, okay? And so the reality is that if I would just submit, if you would just submit, if we would just submit, to the reign of Christ in our life, in all areas at all times, we would fully get a concept of the peace of God, which passes understanding. Isn't that what he says? Do, don't be anxious for anything, but in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your, let your request be made unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding, which will keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And so we know it, and then we would, our life would be prosperous. Not necessarily financially. That's not what he's talking about. But we're talking spiritually. True riches is in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that which is being laid up heavenly. Do you get it? So, how concerned are you, going back to the beginning, of having a proper interpretation of the Bible? It's very important to me. Sometimes it may be more important to me than it, it is to others, and, and it's kind of dry. But I think what I'm, what I'm trying to reveal at those times is, listen, dig into the Word. Don't just read it. Take time to study it. I mean, in your quiet time, you're having one, I hope, right? In your quiet time, expand it to, from, from five minutes to 15 minutes. Or if you're 15 minutes, expand it to a half an hour. If you're doing a half an hour, expand it to an hour. Okay? And when you, when you see a little passage that you're reading, you go, huh, I wonder what that means. Don't just put it off and just keep reading. Stop. Maybe the Holy Spirit's doing something for you right then. 
He's giving you just a little bit of an inkling. So stop and do some what? Research. 1 Corinthians tells us that we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. And that it's the Holy Spirit that's going to let you know the mind of God. So at that moment, it may be that the Holy Spirit's trying to reveal something to you. And if you just take the time to stop and, and, and don't do the other things, but start comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, that he, being your true discipler, not Bob, will be the one who actually trains you and teaches you in his word. You have the same Holy Spirit in you that I have in me. There's nothing special about Bob. Okay? I mean, I know that, that may feel threatening to some when they talk about pastors, but there is nothing special about me. I might be more inquisitive than you are. Okay? Be inquisitive. It's okay. Where does it, where does it the it being interpretation of God's word, where does the interpretation of God's word stand on your list of priorities? Okay? It's very, very important. Jesus said there's going to be false apostles, or false prophets out there, and false Christs out there, um, anointed ones, you know, in the end times. Shiloh is coming. He who is peace. Have you entered into that peace? If you're here today, and, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You honestly don't understand the peace that we've been talking about. You don't know the reign of Christ in your life. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Okay? And I challenge you to do that, to understand the peace that passes understanding that's there. But finally, to us as believers, is Jesus Christ truly the King of your life? Is he reigning on the throne of your heart? And, I, I mean, I, I'm just honest. There's so many times I like to do what? Do the dirty trick. You know, do you, ever, do you ever do the dirty trick on somebody when they're going to sit down? You swipe the, the seat from, out, from underneath them. You know? Sometimes I like to do that to Jesus. You know? <laughs> and I get to sit on the throne. You know? Okay, I'm done. Here, you get to sit on the throne again. And God says, it doesn't work that way. I get the throne. You get the footstool. I just have to be content what? Being at the footstool and not being on the throne. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for you alone are God. You alone are the mighty one. You alone have breathed into us the breath of life. You are the potter. We're the clay. God, you're the king. We're the subjects. Help us, Father, to get a grip on it. Help me to, to, to live in the light of your reign um, daily, Lord. Not just with my lips, but with my, my life. Lord, I pray that if there are some that are here today that, that truly aren't a part of your kingdom, Lord, that, that they would submit to that and they would bow at your throne and they would confess their sins and they would um, give their allegiance to you. For those of us, Lord, who are called by your name, who have the privilege of adoptions as sons, Lord, that you would help us to to live responsibly according to your love. And that we would have a desire to obey you and to please you, to reflect you properly, to make you known, to magnify you, to glorify you in this world, that all men may see you and come to you for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.